Uh, now we will meet a legendary special agent, Jim Cole, supervisor special agent. And he has been working with um, um, child sexual abuse for many, many years. Um, he's an icon in many ways. And Jim, are you there? I'm here. You're there. Uh, good afternoon, Eva. How does it feel to be presented as an icon? <laughs> I think it's the first time. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, hopefully it lives up to the hype. That's good. Okay, you have a, you have prepared a presentation for us, so please start. So in 2004, uh, my life and my career were irrevocably changed when as a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations working in Portland, Oregon, I uh, received a case from Canadian colleagues who uh, had been working on a, a set of child exploitation videos that had become unfortunately uh, encountered by law enforcement globally on numerous occasions and uh, was unfortunately getting quite a lot of popularity amongst offenders online. And when that set of imagery or videos came into us, uh, our Canadian colleagues thought that it might have been produced in our area uh, in the Pacific Northwest due to some clues that they saw in the background of videos uh, that pointed to a restaurant chain and a department store chain. And prior to this uh, referral, uh, I had worked many, many child sexual exploitation investigations uh, with an online nature that uh, our focus as law enforcement was to arrest, you know, identify and arrest these offenders and then prove the crime and present that to a prosecutor for, you know, what happens after that, the judicial process. And in many of those cases, um, the nature of that would, would result in five years in prison. And it wasn't until this particular case uh, where our colleagues in Canada had kind of looked behind that abuse, behind the, the image into other factors, but not just to identify the offender, but to try to find and rescue that child victim. And it seems so obvious, uh, but it was really a significant moment. And from that moment, uh, it revolutionized the way that myself, uh, and then later through the the following years and, and events that, that occurred after that, how as an agency and even law enforcement in the United States approached these cases. And that led to you know, what we term victim identification. And then further from that led to the establishment of an entity called Project Vic um, that I'm one of the, uh, the co-founders of. And through these two things, this process of victim identification and through Project Vic, uh, we're now identifying and rescuing children and it's become much more common and focused in the United States. Now, our global partners were doing this way ahead of us in the United States. As a matter of fact, uh, many, many, many years ago, uh, a Swedish investigator named Anders Persson uh, is really the founding, we kind of call him the founding grandfather of victim identification uh, and really expanded that role when he was seconded to Interpol and the Crimes Against Children team. Um, but for my own journey, that in the United States, it led us to establishing uh, a victim identification program within HSI. And here you see uh, one of the things that I kind of consider one of my legacies, uh, this laboratory, uh, but not just the laboratory, the people that work in it, because the people uh, is really the important factor here. 
And yes, we utilize cutting edge technology and we work and collaborate with companies and it's incredibly important as Anna uh, just described that collaboration between us, but the, the people um, is what make this all work. The technology alone uh, needs the people behind it, both from the users, but from the creators and developers, but also the research and the development that goes into these tools are, are all critically important. And so what I wanna do a little bit is talk about a case, but then really delve into the, the people that are behind this. Right now, law enforcement is under intense scrutiny. Um, and, uh, but I want those the corporations and the, and the industry that we work with to see uh, the heart of the people that are behind when a lead gets referred to them. So in this particular case that came into our lab, we had horrific uh, child sexual exploitation, child abuse of this uh, really young child. And uh, along with the abusive material, the offender also shared some non-abuse material. Uh, he was fairly careful not to expose her face. Um, and in the abuse material, he had gone to great lengths to ensure that there were no clues, that there, there was very little to go on. Uh, the lead came through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And once it, it uh, went through them and, and came to us and they had done some, some really interesting things. They had uh, sought out an expert in flora and fauna. Um, and so the image was sanitized um, and this was sent over to an expert uh, with uh, plant life and, and uh, and such, and using uh, his tools, he was able to determine that the plant life that you see in that image uh, can only grow in the southeastern United States in this area of green, which really narrowed down. I mean, when we're talking about the whole United States, it's massive, and uh, able to narrow this down to just a few states in a specific region was huge. But obviously, there's much more work to be done. And so uh, one of my victim identification specialists uh, started working on this and looked at some of these other images. And here's the image of a child uh, and another child at a playground. And so he started doggedly contacting playground manufacturers and associations and cities and to, to try to find out, is there any way to figure out where this particular playground might be? And after much, uh, just really significant effort, uh, hours on the phone trying to get to the right person, he, he gets to somebody who, who thinks that they can help. And from that actually puts him in touch with the manufacturer of this, this playground. And from that, going through records, they determined that this particular setup that we see in this picture and, and one other, uh, could only, was an installation that occurred in, in one place. It was unique. And so that, uh, as you see in the red circle here, was in the Houston, Texas area. And so from there, uh, figuring out where that playground was in the center of this community um, really leads to the identification of that offender, but more importantly, the identification and safeguarding of that child. And so from that, uh, the investigators then start looking and making sure that yes, this is the same playground and, and the, the Google imagery matched up. And then from other imagery started actually flying that neighborhood in Google Earth and looking at areas and, and here in the previous image, you see there was a basketball hoop in the garage and looking and unfortunately there were, there were several houses like that one of the images uh, from Google Earth actually depicted um, these two houses, but off to the right, it actually depicted an extremely important clue. And that clue turns out to be this mound that you see in the background, this little rise of dirt. And it, through images where the child is playing on this mound of dirt, and then actually looking at the individual trees that are in that area and matching those trees up 
with the big tree, what, what I often say in these presentations, big tree, little tree, little tree, big tree, and confirming that that was the location. And then it, dispatching agents in Texas to that residence, um, th that area and determining where she was. And it was a significant moment. And my, my uh, analyst who did this work, um, I asked him to put, just to jot down some words uh, about this. And I'm going to, I usually hate to read slides, um, but uh, I am going to, to do that for a moment. Um, so he says, I will never forget the adrenaline and overwhelming rush of emotions. I experienced when I found a giant missing piece of the puzzle. I spent so much time working through all the material, asking myself so many questions. I was really frustrated at times while working this particular case. I saw the great lengths this person went through to protect their identity, and it was driving me crazy that I couldn't figure it out. But I kept going. I kept approaching the clues from multiple angles and doing whatever I could think of. Then, in an instant, we finally reached the right person with the right information and asked the right questions. We had suddenly narrowed down the potential location from the entire Southeast region of the country to a specific neighborhood. It was incredible. Now, I keep the foliage map I had to start with as a reminder to myself of the possibilities of perseverance. This analyst, this was his first rescue. And this analyst has now gone on to rescue so many more kids. And here's a picture of, of my team at the time. I've moved on now to a different role, but in our lab and uh, just the people behind these cases and a small, small segment uh, worldwide, there are approximately 75 law enforcement specialists who do this specific type of work, this victim identification it is an incredibly small number of people who specifically devote their time to doing victim identification. Another story that I received uh, from a Belgian colleague and friend, uh, so you want a story, this is mine. I wish I could say I remember the first victim I was part of identifying. That's actually true, but I also remember the last and all those in between. Any image of a victim, whatever image it is, stays in there, in the head, as well as those I worked on but never found the victim. Any picture represents a kid that maybe, yes, you saved in the end, but people like us are always too late, always. Truth is though, it only takes one picture to make sure we're not too late again. Again, the first big case, a quite normal image, a young boy naked, though playful in the garden next to an outdoor table, covered in the lunch or breakfast leftovers and a garbage can in the back. Those kinds of pictures to people like us, a treasure chest. The lunch leftover packages and the garbage can lead to Belgium. And a snapshot from one of the videos gave us a possible mark of a car. And then it was a matter of finding all those car owners in Belgium, easy peasy, not so much. But the picture and the snapshot eventually lead us to the victim and the suspect. We cannot miss out on that picture because truth of it all is that without that one picture, the abuse might still be going on. That time we were on to eventually stop it. Monia Vanyerbeek from the Belgian National Police. From a Swedish colleague, behind every image, there's a child who needs to be found. There's a perpetrator who needs to be found. Tuesday morning, members of the team arrive to the office and coffee and tea is being sipped while we have small talks. Time for a meeting in the briefing room and the topic is a series of images which haven't been seen before and some details in the images point to Sweden. They are shown on a big screen and everyone goes silent. Everyone is dealing with what they see in their own way and everyone is fully concentrated. Someone's making a note. The feeling of determination to find the clues which leads to identifying the child and the perpetrator. The feeling of agony watching another image of child sexual abuse. The feeling of grief because it's never just an image, but proof of a crime. 
the feeling of disgust and anger, watching images of sexual abuse of children. Filled with determination, the team takes on the different tasks to identify the victim. Some of them are following up on more or less obvious details, and others are thinking outside the box. As time passes and there's no breakthrough, the team suffers from frustration. The images don't reveal any clues. The intensive search for information about the nickname of the poster of the images didn't give any result. All effort made and investigative actions done, and still no result. All we have is a long list of potential victims, but no details to make any visual comparison for ID. New images are posted, and the realization that the abuse is ongoing makes it even harder. The feeling of frustration of not having the required tools, feeling of insufficiency when time is passing, the feeling of despair when you can't find the clue, the feeling of hope when you can. Then suddenly there's new information. The suspect has made a mistake. Hectic comparison work starts going through social media, trying to find a picture of the girl. Narrow it down to several candidates. Another picture of a three-year-old girl. Is it the same girl? No, but perhaps the next one or the next one. And there she is. The feeling of euphoria when you find the child. The girl with the red curly hair, there's no doubt. The girl we have been looking for for so long. We just found her on her father's social media. There's a big difference though. In this picture, she's smiling. The feeling of relief when you know the child is safeguarded. The feeling of sadness when you think of how the child will cope. The feeling of determination when you think of all the children waiting to be found. The feeling of gratitude, being part of ending the victimization of a child. And the feeling of determination to never stop trying to find what's behind every image. And this is that team. We have a saying, a few sayings actually, it takes a network to defeat a network, collaboration is key and sharing is caring. And that's for all of us, that's all of us in law enforcement, in industry, in our non-governmental organizations and nonprofits, it, it's important that we keep this at the forefront because none of those cases that you just heard about were an individual, an individual agency. There's so much that goes on behind the scenes and companies like NetClean and the, the other companies in the Safer Society Group umbrella and the different NGOs and the different industry that we work with is incredibly important. This here is, uh, I'm gonna show you some photos of these collaborations occurring. This is uh, an outstanding uh, initiative uh, through Interpol uh, called DevOps, which is really hackathons with, with internet service providers, other companies developing uh, tools and uh, technology and artificial intelligence aimed at this problem. Other folks, or folk, uh, partners at Camera Forensics, Another DevOps, my friends and colleagues at Europol, and our friends and colleagues in Safer Society Group. Our really important partners in this fight, and this is just a small list, there's so many more. So the challenge now is how do we work closer? How do we stop the abuse? It's a daunting, daunting question. And it's a difficult challenge, but only by collaboration, working together and ensuring that those people that you just heard about have the right tools to do that job, to hopefully reduce that frustration and increase the hope and the joy is what will make the difference. Thank you. Thank you, Jim Cole. It was uh, incredible to hear the stories about the playground and Belgium and how you managed to find the, the offender, at least, at last. Tell me, this is a very cons time-consuming way of, of uh, investigating. But now you have also the tool of artificial intelligence. How has that changed your work? 
So um, there's been a revolution in artificial intelligence just over the past uh, several years. And we're starting to really see promise in those algorithms and tools. They're not quite there yet to rely on them in whole. You still need that human in the loop uh, to, to verify, uh, as some of previous uh, presenters uh, like Hans uh, Luke talked about. Um, but I think that in this revolution, the technology will only, will only continue to get better. And through these collaborations and partnerships and hackathons and initiatives, um, it's just a matter of time before we can at least reduce the, the, the need for that human in the loop uh, to such an extent that we can start to do things in, in, in more real, uh, near real time. Uh, and that's really where we'd like to see. I mean, I, I think that when we're chasing the creation of imagery that then gets posted online, uh, we're already behind the curve and that's where we've been and we're constantly in law enforcement working to catch up. So um, it's that proverbial cat and mouse game. With the AI and kind of the ideas that are coming from our partners and, and I can't take credit for this idea, but from uh, an important partner that's uh, very passionate about this work, you know, he posed to me the question, he said, why can't we stop like in our camera devices that we all carry around in our pockets, which is where the majority of this material comes from, or in our digital devices, which, you know, they're digital devices. So we can actually potentially intervene at the creation of an image. What if AI could tell us that this is a sexually inappropriate image of a child and not actually even take the image or allow the image to be taken? Um, that's one start. Then you what if our ESPs and ISPs had filtering capability when images are introduced in their network that would prevent that material from ever being uploaded?